Welcome to episode 28 and a long overdue season three finale of the Tailoring Talk Show with me, your host, Roberto Rivilla. I'm a bespoke tailor, menswear designer and owner of Roberto Rivilla London Suit and Shirt Makers. This is the podcast where you drop in for the threads but often leave with something quite unexpected. If you haven't already, please support the show by subscribing. And if you're listening to me on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please help me out by leaving a rating and a review. Today, I'm joined by a returning guest who we met all the way back in episode 15. He has spent a life in sales, starting in retail and working his way through multiple roles, eventually pivoting and retraining to become a successful five-star rated mortgage consultant at the award-winning Dynamo one of the UK's largest brokerage firms. Yes, you regular listeners have guessed that Philip Rahman is back in the Tailoring Talk house. Philip, Happy New Year. How are you? Hey, Bobby, I'm doing good. Happy New Year to you, mate. Um, So uh, back to working from home. Yeah, I'm uh, working from home. I'm in the cabin. It's uh, it's quite cold in here, but um, it's all fine. And uh, it's... It seems to be going quite well. Be a decent start this year, but um, I would, if I'm honest, there's there's benefits of being in the office and there's benefits from working at home. And um, you know, I've just got to, you know, have in mind and you know what are the best, you know, what are my, what's uh, you know most important for me, um, you know, depending on my situation. So yeah, I mean, it, it basically, is it that your firm has closed the offices, or are the offices still open if you want to go in? There are people in the offices who have to do house shares and there's people that don't have access to um, the sort of, you know, space that I do. So what they basically said is if there's a valid reason to uh, be able to work from the office, then work from the office. Otherwise, if you're able to work from home, then work from home. And I am able to work from home. So I'd rather give the space up to someone who is more vulnerable that's going to need it more than I am. So yeah. that's the reason why. I suppose a lot of your younger colleagues that are in flat shares and house shares or very, very this small apartments yeah. and that sort of thing and just don't, maybe they're on top of each other and working from home just isn't practical. So obviously, you know, going into the office is going to be better for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's, uh, you know, not going to be a situation we're in for much longer considering our beleaguered prime minister... <laughs> Is uh, <laughs> under all forms of attack, but we're not a political podcast, so we're not going to go in there. Let's not let's not get let's not get political tonight. That's for sure. And uh, yeah, I'm also trying to keep the podcast clean, actually, or as clean as possible. And uh, talking about the blonde buffoon is uh, not a really great way to do that. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't realise you had a. I didn't realise that uh, you're trying to keep it clean. I didn't think that was your style. No, not really. But the other podcast that I do, Play Paul's Turn, is a clean podcast. Although I'm, right. I tend to be the culprit that basically then gets us a an R rating on some episodes. Um, right. Although I was very well behaved on the last one, which was uh, which was a uh, a massive review of. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, and also The Matrix Resurrections. So, uh, yes. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen... You, you, I, haven't, I haven't seen The Matrix Resurrection, but then I haven't seen any of the sequels of The Matrix. I knew that when I saw the first Matrix film and when it ended, and when Keanu Reeves... Spoiler alert, everyone. When Keanu Reeves decides to fly off um, and disappear into the screen, I knew that was the conclusion that I wanted to see. And I knew I didn't want to see any others, even at that early stage. Yeah. I didn't have that same feeling with Blade, though. I was happy to just, you know, have um, the entertainment of, um, you know, Wesley Snipes, you know, kicking ass, because that was what the film was all about. There was no plot. It was just about seeing bullet time, which was, by the way, you know, Blade did it before The Matrix. Really? Going slightly off here. Yeah. Yeah, they did bullet time in um, Blade before they did it in the Matrix. I'm gonna have they to. They slowed go... down the bullet. They slowed down the bullet when they when he was shooting at um, the enemy. 
I'm gonna have to. And, I'm gonna have to watch. I mean, I want to watch Blade again anyway because it is such a great film. Um, yeah. And actually, you know, if you think about it, Marvel, modern Marvel movies really owe quite a huge debt to Blade because that was the yeah. first proper, successful, great quality Marvel movie. This is the wrong podcast. I should be. We should be on Playboy's turn talking about this. Um, but I, I will definitely go and check that out. Um, and uh, whilst we're here, because I, you know, having known you as long as I have, you won't be bothered, uh, and you'll probably thank me for telling you. But uh, yeah, the, the new Matrix. What was the point, really? Honestly, I downloaded the original the other day. It's just such a classic. I love that movie so much. Um, but I mean, they, I would they imagine should have, they should have just left it at that. Really, they, there was no need to make any more. But anyway. But didn't they bring back all the old actors so a lot of them were out of work and they probably just needed work and, you know, had to pay for divorces? No, and like that's that, not please. true. Keanu Reeves, totally not out of work. He's got the John Wick franchise going strong. He's doing other stuff. Uh, then Carrie Ann Moss, she's still working. They're all working. They're all working busy actors. Okay. So. OK, fair enough. Yeah, that's you being a cynical old fart. I am. I am sometimes. Yeah, yeah for sure. Exactly. Um. <laughs> So, talking about cynical old farts, uh, we lost Sean Connery <laughs> a little while ago. I wasn't going to segue into Bond this early, but, you know, <laughs> we're, we're there now. We're there now. Well, I don't know. Actually, we'll come back to that because uh, you you were a tailor once upon a time. We were in the same industry together. Yeah. Bit of interesting yeah. industry news. Might as well keep the... This is the last episode of season three. It's long overdue. And actually, Phil, if I may, I just want to talk to the listeners here. I owe you guys and girls a huge apology. Uh, the last episode went out. Uh, it was me and Ivan Funk Boy Bodley uh, at the beginning of December. And I promised you that you wouldn't wait long for the next episode and we would close this finale out. And I had lots and lots of guests lined up in December and for various multiple reasons, um, scheduling problems, things coming up due to COVID, um, our business virtually having to shut again around 10th of December because of the new stay, stay home, work from home advice and a whole load of other stuff. We just, it was so difficult to either keep guests in or for them to keep their commitments and everything just fell apart. So I, I'm really, really sorry that this is a belated um, goodbye to season three, which has been the biggest season of Tailoring Talk. Um, I'm sorry you've had to wait for it. Um, I am going to promise and make a commitment that it will not happen again. I mean, a month between episodes is crazy. And uh, I know some of you have, uh, have been very kind and you've been sort of nudging me along asking when the ne next one is, is coming and it's here. Um, so, so yeah, and Happy New Year, everybody. Um, hope whatever you all did, you had a good and safe Christmas and you had lots of fun. Um, so Phil and I, have, uh, we did actually meet up over Christmas because I am godfather to, to Phil's sons and... Phil's one of my best friends. Um, we're like family. So uh, we did, uh, we, we have been coming up with an idea that I think you guys and girls are really going to kind of get into for 2022 and beyond. It's going to be quite a long project, but I'll come on to that in a bit. Anyway, sorry, back to a bit of news that came uh, from our industry and your old industry, Phil. Uh, Geeves and Hawks, that... Mm. Big Savile Row institution, number one Savile Row, been around for years and years and years, donkey's years. Um, yeah. They have gone into administration. Um, right. I don't know if you caught that. In the, it was all over the national I didn't, news. I, I didn't, but it's not, I wouldn't be, from, from Geeves and Hawke's point of view, I can't say that I would be that concerned about it if the business is strong enough then a buyer will come in and uh, look to buy them and either keep it as it is or someone else will or some other company will do something else to the company and it will do something else. So I'm not too concerned about it. Okay, so um, I will give you some news. So as you know, I deal with a lot of clients in private equity and all that sort of thing. No one wants to yeah. buy Goose and Hawks. 
Oh, okay. So it looks like it is going down the Swanee, and it's very sad. I mean, Gives has been around since the late 1700s, uh, when Thomas Hawkes originally set up the his first shop in Brewer Street in Soho. Um, and basically, they they were mainly known for selling outfits to British Army commanders. And then in the early 1900s, Hawks & Co. bought the freehold of uh, Number 1 Savile Row, um, where the Royal Geographical Society was originally located. Um, and it became the historic tailoring house that we know today. It was bought out by a Chinese... Um, conglomerate or whatever uh, I think they're called Trinity Group and uh, they have now appointed liquidators um, and from what I've heard on the inside nobody's interested in buying it because they've basically just got so much debt on the business um, that nobody wants to take that on so the only interest is uh, from Marks and Spencers at the moment are sort of fishing around to see if they could maybe just kind of strip something out of Gives and Hawks or maybe even just buy the name and then stick that maybe on one of their own in-house brands. But it's, it, yeah, it's not looking good. It looks like we are going to lose Gives and Hawks, which from a, a certain point of view is um, presents a unique opportunity for, for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's sad because there is room in the world for, for you know, everybody that's involved with tailoring and so on. Um, but although I have to say, one of my clients came in today and I fitted his new um, his new jacket. It's the one on Instagram that you and I were having a look yeah. back and forth, that really beautiful red jacket with the blue plaid. And um, yeah. I've, and it did, just... he, did he, cho- he chose that specific, he did, he chose that specifically for a, specific occasion or did you just pick it out for him no so he his family that, that was part of the reason he was wearing a face mask is to hide identity um but his family owns a lot of businesses worldwide and they are involved with one particular ex premiership club um and so his job is looking after some of the business interests over here in the UK and he doesn't need to wear a suit all the time. And in fact, his big thing is he just likes being comfortable in his clothes as well. He doesn't like things super fitted and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah. he he did need to work on his business casual or smart casual game. Um, so I think he was kind of sort of motivated by a friend of his that they met once. And he really liked the way his friend was dressed a bit smarter for business rather than just wearing chinos and a shirt. And so we we kind of put this first outfit together for him, which, you know, is kind of designed to look quirky, make him memorable, but also be quite kind of classy. So if I describe it, I mean, if you're listening to this, if you go onto my Instagram at Roberto Rivilla London and you look at a post from uh, we're recording this today on the 11th of January, um, you'll see the outfit there. It's uh, my client. He's wearing a kind of burgundy red jacket that's got a navy check running through it. Um, And then we paired that with a a dark, uh, sorry, a dark red uh, stretch knit shirt um, and black trousers. And it just looks so classy. I mean, it it does. What did you think when you first saw it, Phil? Yeah, uh, break from the norm, basically. Because the thing is, it's it's not easy to to keep where we are at the moment, interesting in the sense that there is a lot less people out meeting people. So to keep things interesting and keep people motivated to wear their clothes, I would imagine is quite difficult for someone in your profession. So if you can keep people interested by showing off something that's a little bit more interesting and grab people's attention a little bit more, I think it's going to make a difference. And I think that you achieved that with that one. I'm not going to blow smoke up your but it did work on that particular occasion. So fair enough. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'd like to think most of what I do for my clients, if not all, actually works really well. Really well. They walk out of the workroom absolutely rocking, whatever. And you, the no, stuff I've made for you, excuse me, choose... the stuff I've made for you, dude, come on. Yeah, but I chose it. I think the majority of people that choose their own stuff, which you have to kind of like, they have to buy something that they're going to want to wear, you know, very few of them are going to really sort of go really out there and interesting. Maybe 
two or three percent will and everyone else is just going to go blues grays yeah i mean what now. on the smart casual side i mean that'll never change the blues grace thing on the suit side of things but on the smart casual side what we're trying to what i'm trying to talk to people about is considered dressing so yeah whatever you wear whether it's a suit whether it's business casual whether it's smart casual whether it's casual casual considered dressing for me means um looking like you thought about things before you left the house so whatever you're wearing yeah. it just looks like you put a little bit of consideration into it rather than just looking like you threw whatever on and you didn't care yeah um so you know because impressions are important they're still important whether whether you're meeting people face to face or you're on zoom calls like we've had to go back to now um you know i, th- I think it's still important that you show up and you show up a hundred percent so you're prepared you look like you're presentable and you've thought about your outfit and so on and you just look like you know what you're doing so uh anyway that's just me um but clients are definitely responding to it so any of my clients listening to this i'm very proud of all of you um so uh where was i going with this so he brought in a geeves and hawks jacket that he'd spent a fair amount of money on and wanted to know if i could alter it to look anything like my clothes fit on him because my clothes look perfect on him and uh, after about 15 20 minutes of playing around with this thing i just I had to say to him, it's just not worth it. We would have had to have done so much to it um, to get it anywhere near like how he likes his clothes to fit and look. It was just completely the wrong. You know, it's off the peg. The sleeves were set so far forward. We would have had to take them off and switch, you know, switch them around a different way. And um, it's it just highlighted um, a reason why over my long career, nearly 20 years now, um, I've had so many clients who've bought, been buying from places like that and then eventually end up at, you know, the door of people like me. Um, you know, I don't think it helped Gives when they did sell to this Chinese conglomerate, not because of where they're from, but that's just what happens when you kind of sell out like that. And apparently a lot of their debt, like they owe millions apparently to David Beckham's company because uh, he was doing a lot of promo work for them for the Kent and Kerwin brand. Um, And nobody wants to take that amount of debt on. So it does sadly look like they're going to go down the Swanee. Um, We might see the Geeves and Hawks name survive, um, maybe at M&S if they manage to pull a deal through to take the rights to the brand. But I don't, I, I just... I don't see how that has the same uh, gravitas that it has done for the last couple of hundred years. So anyway, bit of, bit of tailoring news there. Very sad. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, you mentioned like David Beckham being associated with Geeves and Hawks. I had no idea about the fact that he was associated with Geeves and Hawks. Not with it shows. Not with Geeves directly, but one of their brands that's within the group is Kent and Kerwin, who are, are really okay. famous right. for kind of doing a lot of, uh, I think, rugby or cricket, you know, sports people wearing that brand okay um okay but uh you know as much as you do take pride in how you dress for work outside of that you're not exactly a gq reader or anything or you know total follower of fashion i mean you're sitting there in a lumberjack shirt for god's sake uh, this this from the guy wearing just a gray t-shirt not you know, wearing a gray t-shirt sure probably got some sweat you know, some sweatpants and sort of no, delete, sweat. no hey, excuse me i'm wearing bespoke jeans <laughs> check out my tush see uh, no, nah, I'd, really ra- I'd really rather not. <laughs> these are my jeans, my black stretch jeans, which you can get now. Made in house. Must be nice. They're so comfortable. <laughs> I mean, you, literally, you can do anything in them. You can cycle in them, run in them. Anyway, right. So, uh, so anyway, so that's that. So, Phil, you and I were talking over Christmas. I got. Oh, what did you get for Christmas? Did you get anything nice? Um, what did I get for Christmas? Um. I got some really quite boring sort of like middle-aged stuff. Um, should, I'm quite ashamed to say this, but it is practical. Um, I got myself, uh, my wife got me a dash cam because I asked for one. Oh, cool. Um, so, I was, so, do you know what? It's really funny because I was literally just looking at dash cams before we came on. Actually, yeah. no, that's not, that's not 100% true. I was looking at dash cams and then I looked at the time and I thought I've got just enough time to... Uh, quickly play a qualifier game for FIFA Ultimate Team for the Champions League. 
<laughs> that went to penalties and I won, by the way. Thank you. Um, awesome. And uh, and then I had a problem with an Amazon delivery. Anyway, sorry. So um, uh, you got a dash cam. Yeah, so that, what did so you get? I got some, I got some, so I got a dash cam. Um, I got some coffee stuff. I'm really into my coffee at the moment. Mm-hmm. So I got some really nice coffee and a coffee sort of um, solution thing to keep that all uh, in check. Wife and I, we kind of just got each other um, more practical things. So we needed to get a new bed. So we got a really, really nice new uh, plush bed, which is kind of our Christmas mm-hmm. present to one another. This year is going to be an expensive year. It's my wife's uh, big birthday for my wife. So we're going to do some very nice stuff. Yes. Um, Sam's, in the next 12 Sam's months. Sam's going so, to be uh, 40. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. That's what it is. Exactly. Yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, I got, I mean, these are all things I got myself, right? <laughs> I got them. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I got <laughs> big breath. Deep, deep breath. I got an Xbox Series X. I got, um, I got Carolina an iPad Mini, which which is for you. No, it's for her. Like it's all set up okay. for her, her login, her user thing, and all of that. I will borrow it though because it's so cute. Yeah, of course. Because um, we have yeah. a shared Kindle account, and I like reading. But my, I've got the iPad Twelve Pro, the massive one. And, yeah. you know, sort of trying to read with that in bed is a bit tricky. So I will nick hers from time to time. Um, God, what else did I get myself? I got myself a couple of things, actually. But the but anyway, the, the most important one was that I got myself the James Bond Taschen, who were a kind of bookmaker publisher thing in Germany. They've got these coffee table books that are absolutely amazing. And I got myself the James, Bo- James Bond archives, which is fully up to date. Every Bond movie from Doctor No going all the way through to No Time to Die. And it weighs an absolute ton. It is huge. I mean, literally, I'm holding my arms apart. I'm not even exaggerating. Like, when you come here, I'll show it to you, obviously. Um, And it's so heavy. It must weigh a good 10, 15 kilos, if not more. It's seriously. So... um, it's just fascinating it's every single bond movie it goes into so much depth and detail about the production the making of there are script notes shooting schedules it's it's just such a treasure trove of rich information about these movies and um phil you recently watched dr no didn't you yeah had you basically what it was sorry go ahead yeah i was just gonna say no Growing up, got to confess, I wasn't a fan of James Bond. And the reason for that is nothing to do with what James Bond was or his ideals or anything like that. It's more to do with the fact that I associated James Bond with very, very bad bank holidays growing up, where <laughs> um, parents just didn't, you know, were usually having, you know, I don't go into too much detail. I didn't have an unhappy childhood. Everything was fine. But every so often, my parents, but they would choose to have arguments that tend to be on bank holidays when they were struggling to find something to do with us. And the reality was, I didn't really want to do much with them. I just wanted to just chill and just... And that's the thing. Back then, if you wanted to do something, you could just go down the road and see your mates. Like, if my boy wants to go out and see his mates or something like that, we have to prearrange it. It has to be a play day. Mm. Whereas before, we could just knock around people's houses, no problem at all. And that's all I really wanted to do. But they were insistent that they did stuff with us, whether it takes us to museums or take us to, you know, national parks or, you know, national trust or whatever. And... When they, there was occasions where they couldn't figure out what they wanted to do, and what would end up happening is they'd have an argument, and what would be on in the background is some James Bond movie, and I couldn't sit down and enjoy watching that when they're shouting at one another. So I just kind of like turned off and said, sod this, I'm going to go out and see my mates. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much what happened. And, and I just kind of felt like James Bond movie, because they're so long, you know. And um, so it was a large part of the afternoon, and... So I would associate it with that and then I wouldn't wouldn't watch it again. But then I saw the very last one and I've seen all of the Pierce Brosnan films. I did kind of get back into it, going to the cinema, seeing the Pierce Brosnan films. But we saw the last one, the No Time to Die film. And it occurred to me watching this film that they had to try and appease uh, an audience that's evolved into quite brittle eared audience that can't handle you know people going out and doing exactly what they want when they want and with with who they want as well which is kind of what 
the earlier James Bond films were all about. So I decided to start watching all of the early James Bond films, films I'd never seen before. I'd never seen Doctor No until a few weeks ago. And I saw it for the first time and I was absolutely blown away. Really? I thought, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, the, in fact, I've seen so far, I'm up to Diamonds Are Forever, starting from the very beginning. I still think Doctor No is the best one out of the ones I've seen so far. Mm. And that includes the later ones. Okay, well, look, save that for for what we're about to announce. Or we are going to announce. Okay. At some, I, I know, about to, we're going to announce it at some point in the next 10 to 15 minutes before we wrap this up. Um, so that's really interesting because for me, um, I, one of my uncles, my de- my mum's youngest brother, when we used to go to his house, I remember he had, do you remember when, you know, VHS tapes and people had these kind of cases for them that looked like books when they were on the shelf? Oh, yes, remember it's those? a very Asian thing. Very Asian oh, yes, thing, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So he <laughs> had, up to the time, I think, I remember him sitting me in front of, of Live and Let Die, because uh, I remember Scaramanga, Christopher Lee's um, Three Nipples as a kid and The Golden Gun. Um, yeah. It's a bit weird that that's the only thing I can remember from that film. But, I mean, look, I must have, I must have been... Are you, sure you, are you sure you weren't mixing up with one of his video nasties that he oh, held? Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Like, keep it clean, yeah. Bookcases. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was, it was definitely that. And, um, and um, so, 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 I'm, so I was obviously sat in front of these movies as a kid. The only ones that stick in my mind that I can remember the film as a child, I can, put, I can go back to that memory and imagine myself as a little kid sat on the floor, cross-legged in front of the television, in front of, and remember the film pretty much from start to finish, or remember the major beats, are Superman, Superman 2, Star Wars, A New Hope, um, and the animated version of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The Bond films... Oh, oh that's, that's the, the... There's a very, like... There's a lot of different variations. They went from like the the big blockbusters to a Canadian sort of animated Lion, the Witch, and the yeah. Wardrobe, <laughs> and Enter the Dragon. Oh yeah, okay. You know, even awesome. though rated eighteen, but my mum and dad didn't care. It was what kept me quiet when I was three years old. You know, um, so <laughs> um, so so James Bond is a weird one for me because technically. I should say that Roger Moore is is my Bond growing up because it was all his films around that time when 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 we were kids because we're the same age. Um, and Sean Connery really was one of those that tended to be on in the background on bank holidays when we were visiting my grandmother's house and all my other uncles, aunts and cousins were around and it would just be Diamonds Are, are Forever or Doctor No would be rerunning on television and they would just have it on in the background. Um, and we would just be waiting for Knight Rider to be on so that they could change the channel and put Knight Rider on instead because that was infinitely more fun. Or Street Hawk or Airwolf or any of the vehicles. The, a- the A-Team. The A-Team, exactly. The Incredible Hulk. Um, God, what a golden era of tele- Spider-Man, the Nicholas Hammond one. <laughs> um, and so Bond really didn't... And then, you know, the Timothy Dalton phase kind of passed me by completely. That was, you know, because I, I was maybe only nine, ten years old at the time. Um, so for me, the big one really was Pierce Brosnan. So I remember when yeah. GoldenEye came out, because it was the big reboot of Bond. Brosnan was cast. I didn't really know Pierce Brosnan from anything. I know that my mum fancied him because she used to watch Remington Steel, and she thought he was, you know, super handsome, and she fancied the pants off him. To oh, be, my wife fancies him as well. To be <laughs> fair, he still is a good-looking guy, you know. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so so Brosnan was a big one, and there were the promotion around that film, and and it was the first Bond film that I purposely went to watch, and also I saw it in the cinema as well. And then we got it. You remember because it was the dawn of DVD, the mid nineties, and so I had. Goldeneye, when you and I worked at Comet, Goldeneye was one of my initial demo DVDs. So I had that on DVD and I would uh, I would 
play the um the car the car no, it wasn't the car park scene so goldeneye well it didn't matter really i'd play any of the action sequences from it um on the big toshiba 3339db in the sound in the, <laughs> in the home in, oh, yeah. <laughs> home theater um and I, I just love that movie. And then obviously there was the game on the Nintendo 64, which was absolutely phenomenal. It was like one of the best computer games ever. Um, and then I, I was just hooked on Brosnan's Bond from there on in. And it didn't mean that I then went back to the films before. It was literally, it was GoldenEye onwards. Tomorrow Never Dies, I absolutely love that film. Again, saw it in the cinema on my own. Uh, the um, the seven series car chase scene in 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 the German car park, which is actually Brent Cross, which is just up the road from me. Um, I would go in my little Ford Fiesta and kind of do donuts in there, trying to recreate that whole thing without plunging my car off the top deck. Um, the world is not enough, which was the one with Robert Carlyle as the villain, and and Sophie Marceau was the Bond girl in that. That's always going to be very special for me for two reasons. Number one, the computers that they used at Eon Productions to create the special effects for The World Is Not Enough were um, were all specified and sold by me because Eon was one of my accounts when I worked at Dantech. Um, so that was very special. And the other reason that film's very special to me is that it's the first movie and the first Bond movie that I actually saw with my dad at the cinema. Um, right. So, so that was always very special. And then, unfortunately, Brosnan's sort of reign as Bond ended on a bum note with um, um, "Die Another Day." Die Another Day. Yeah, the mod. Yeah. You know that just started it's, wrong. That's the one with the invisible car, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, All right. It's not great. The opening part is really great up to the credits because he he's in peril and he gets captured and all the rest of it. But then it, yeah, it was just very disappointing. Um, I think in the cinema, watching Die Another Day, if you're only going to watch it once and you had no preconceived ideas, I saw it before because I was, at that time, I had no responsibility, so I could watch it pretty much the first weekend of the film coming out. So I didn't hear any of the reviews about it. I literally just went to see it. And because of the excitement of it and all the noise and everything like that, it didn't bother me about all of the the preamble and all the nonsense that went on in the film because I did enjoy it because it was, it was just, it was just entertaining. I didn't sort of have any kind of ex expectation about it. I personally wasn't that bothered about the invisible car. Everyone else seemed to be. Um, I think it depends it on your was... level of investment in Bond. If you weren't that vested yeah, in Bond, you wouldn't it. be bothered. It would no. just be like a popcorn movie. But for someone like me, yeah. who by that time was just so invested in Pierce Brosnan's Bond, uh, and by yeah. then I had read some of the um, the books that were written after Ian Fleming had died by Sebastian Fawkes, I think the author's name is. And, uh, you know, I just think up until that point, Brosnan had done such a good job. And it wasn't his fault. It obviously is the writing and all the rest of it. But, yeah, I was, I was, and to this day, particularly displeased about The Invisible Car and a few other things in that film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only, the only one that really kind of triggered me, I think, was um, Quantum of Solace, but it wasn't necessarily their fault. It was the fact that they had a writer's strike and they didn't have a way of writing an ending for it or even any kind of tangible story that made any well, sense. Well, they actually they, um, they booked, they, they had all the sets, you know, everything was booked and set up, and but they didn't have a script, but they had to get on yeah. with filming. So they, they yeah. basically just went ahead and started filming stuff and the script kind of got written along the way. And I think that film, yeah, I think under the circumstances, that film is not as bad as it maybe could and could, could, could have and should have been. It's actually, yeah. if you, if you watch it as, if you watch Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace back to back as a two hander, it actually works quite well. I think it's not, it's yeah. definitely the weakest one of the Daniel Craig set of five, but it's not a terrible, terrible film. I, I'm pretty yeah. sure we're going to find Bond films that are worse than that Quantum of Solace. Yeah, but um, I think so. I mean, I think prior to me seeing Doctor No, I think Skyfall was my favourite out of all of the films. Um, but prior to seeing Sky, 
you know, now that I've seen Dr. No, I would have to put Dr. No above it. I just feel like the, in the, in the world we live in now, a film like Dr. No would never be made again. So, not in the same way. So let's, let's not talk about that right now. Okay. Because we are going to have an opportunity in the future, aren't we? Um, yes. So Daniel Craig era has been great, though. I think overall as a set of films. I might change my opinion on this, though. Um, but anyway, so the Daniel Craig set, I mean, we rewatched them from Casino Royale up to Spectre in preparation for going to see No Time to Die. And... So I was just waiting for Emily to start going into a barking frenzy there. No, she's she's gone quiet again. It's so hard to edit that stuff out. Um, So, yeah, in preparation for No Time to Die. And, you know, everybody who's listening, if you've listened to the No Time to Die mega review with the Playpool's 10 boys on this podcast, all theirs, um, you'll know my feelings on that film. I absolutely love it. I can't wait to see it again. I've got it queued up on my Apple TV because I bought it a couple of weeks ago. Um, absolutely brilliant um you know daniel craig i think overall has been a very very strong bond and he's definitely he edges brosnan out brosnan out for me and i think what also helps his cause is just the amount of passion and the work ethic and the things that he has done to just bring as much authenticity to that role as possible. So I really salute him. If my wife is ever in a yoga changing room in the nud with his wife ever again, I will get her to call me so I can get over there and actually, um, you know, give my compliments in person, amongst other oh things. My <laughs> oh, my days. Okay. Well, only your mind would go there. <laughs> I just want to say, can you please tell your husband that I think he's awesome? Um, okay. So, <laughs> so, but I've not actually, so I've actually got no conscious memory of having watched any of the Sean Connery films all the way through. I know that I definitely have with Roger Moore ones. I remember Moonraker being one of my favourites as a child, but that was just because of all the space stuff and the lasers and everything. But and yeah, Jaws, Jaws was that. like one of my yeah. favourite characters. Yeah, I did see Moonraker years ago, and then I saw it again more recently. And I'm not sure whether or not when I saw it, it was cut uh, considerably, if it was edited, uh, the one I saw. But it just, it was, it did seem like they were trying to cash in on uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Because it was out around the same time. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can deep dive into this and uh, find out all these sorts of things. And we will. Oh, do you know what? Should we just, should we just tell everybody... What, we, what we're up to? Yeah, what we do. Okay, Bobby. so what Phil and I are going to do, we Phil's got a little head start on me. I don't know if you're going to go back and start them again so that we're sort of watching in line with each other. But what Phil and I are going to do, starting this month, we're going to go from Doctor No, we're going to do one Bond movie a month, and we're going to go all the way up to the present day No Time to Die, which is probably going to take over two years. But by that time, hopefully, they'll have chosen a new James Bond, and by the time we finish this Bondathon, um, we will then be ready for whatever the next chapter of James Bond is going to be. Um, so we are going to have a regular monthly episode. Uh, we're both going to watch each of these films in order. We're going to get together on the pod with you guys and girls, and we are going to talk about. Uh, our reaction to the film, our review um, about the outfits, about the gadgets, the girls, the acting, the everything. We're going to get deep into each one, and uh, and yeah, no 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 punches pulled, no holds barred, all of that stuff. It's going to be super exciting. I couldn't think of anyone better to be doing this with as well. Um, Phil, how are you feeling about it? I feel really good about it. I think that we're going to have some new eyes on it because it's easy to look back over what they thought about it in 62 when they first came out. And there was a different perception of what the world was like back then. And I'm not saying I necessarily want to get back to all of those uh, times in terms of the 1960s, but there were certain things where 
you know, there was a it was a freer way of thinking and there was a freer way of being able to do things. And it harks back to being able to kind of just glance back and see how things were and how things and we can take the things that actually were really cool and maybe we can learn a little bit from that. Yeah. No, totally. I can't wait to do this. We might have someone join us, um, Artif Gafar, uh, Zebra Home Cinema, the sound doctor, who's been on the podcast a couple of times before. He's a massive Bond fan, like absolutely huge. Um, I would love to have his house and his cinema de- demo room to be watching these films on, but I don't. So unfortunately, it'll just have to be my Blu-ray player and um, and my telly. So there we go. Um yeah, so Phil and I, after this, we're going to get these dates scheduled in. Make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. But this is going to be epic. I'd love for everybody to join in as well. Um, obviously not on the actual podcast, but outside of that on social media and so on. I'm also going to be um, just kind of formalising a few things with regards to tailoring talk actually um, getting uh, tailoring Talk's own Instagram, Twitter, so that the kind of lines of communication into the podcast are a bit easier and more straightforward. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of work to do in the coming weeks, and I'm going to fit everything in. But anyway, there we go. Um, so, Phil, how are you going to be watching these? Because uh, have you got? Because I've got them all on. I've got them all on Blu-ray. Not. I yeah. haven't got Spectre, and I haven't got No Time to Die on Blu-ray. But I've got everything else up to Skyfall. So, if yep. you want. I can I can give those to you when we next get together. Yeah, cool. Have you Excellent. got? A, I mean, I'm, I can. Have you got? A I can Blu-ray? stream them. Have you got a Blu-ray thingy at home? What a Blu-ray player? I look at this. Should do. Look at yeah, this, I'm, ladies I'm, and gents. We're setting this up live. This is you know I'm not going to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was going to stream them, but I mean, like, if you've got. If, I mean, next time we see each other, if you've got them handy, then yeah, absolutely. yeah, you can. They're like, just in a helpful. they're just in a display cabinet. I've never, I, you know, I've never used them. I've I've actually bought all of them on iTunes. So I, I because then at least that way, if my schedule goes completely haywire, it means that I can I've got them on my phone, my iPad, etc. I can just watch them wherever because I want to make sure okay. that that's not that's not a reason, Mister Clients, to be cancelling appointments with Bobby. Okay, I know he wants to see his films, but don't cancel your appointments with Bobby. No, just totally to not. I mean, when I talk about kind of you know <laughs> watching these things, I mean you know I, I'm, I, we're we're going to get our recording dates in the diary ahead of time, so I will know when I've got to watch and all the rest of it. But things do happen and things do come up when you're running your own business or you're in sales. It's it can get crazy, uh, and obviously I've got a life outside of the business and the podcast, and that gets crazy as well. Um, but it does mean if I've got them available to stream on my devices, usually when I'm in the gym, sat on a walk bike or something, it's a really or you know on the train or whatever, it's just a good time for me to kind of watch stuff. Um, but uh, I think I I really don't want to be watching these films on a small screen. I want to be watching them on my proper setup at home. So uh, so hopefully I won't have any need to you know, be watching <laughs> under the covers on my iPhone at two o'clock in the morning ever. Yeah. But, you know, let's see how think, it goes. I think the great thing about, I think the great thing about the, the age that my children are at now, I can get up on a Saturday morning before they actually wake up. They're at that age now where they sleep in. So I can actually get to watch them on a Saturday morning before they wake up yeah. and um, and just, you know, have, have my fill and really enjoy it. It's It'd be kind of interesting. The first, be the first thing I think about. Yeah, what I'd also like to do is maybe just have a, some of them. I know I won't get Carolina involved with all of them and you probably wouldn't get Sam involved with all of them either, but the odd one or two here and there, if we can, you know, maybe have a little bit of a date night and watch them with the girls, it'd be interesting to get the female perspective particularly on the older films as well. I mean, I know Carolina would just take the mick the whole time, but, um, but it, I, you know, I, I, I think it just brings a different perspective. As much as you and I doing it is actually the perfect thing because I'm someone who's sort of grown up with Bond, highly conscious of it, read some of the books, you know, complete religiously kind of knows the Bond, the Brosnan ones and the Daniel Craig ones like the back of my hand. 
and then you've not really been a fan, you've not really been vested in it. You watched Dr. No for some reason a few weeks ago, absolutely blew your mind off, and now you're kind of, well, I'm forcing you if you weren't going to, to watch all of them again. <laughs> Um, I think but again, it's the female, interesting about when you, female perspective. Would I be think interesting. it's interesting you talk about the female perspective because in Sam's, you know, with with my wife, when she watches the film, she really enjoys them. It's not about like a female like perspective. It's it's just a real sort of enjoyment, sense of enjoyment. And you know, she has um, you know beliefs, and we've you know we've moved on in terms of you know uh, how sort of uh, men are and how women are and things like that. But when it comes to watching those old films she just loves them and you know it doesn't matter about the the casual levels of sexism and the casual levels of um you know slight misogynism <laughs> she just loves them you know yeah. it's just i mean i, I it, it still blows me away i mean some the early scenes of diamonds are forever which we which will come to um absolutely blow my mind in terms of how films are made now compared to why they're made then yeah. but we'll talk more about that also it'd be interesting for us to compare set piece after the previous set piece and see if the uh producers uh, and the stunt teams and the director's um goals hold true over time because the 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 goal vic reeves who was one of the was it vic reeves vic no vic armstrong vic something wouldn't be Vic Reeves. No, not Vic Reeves. <laughs> so the wonder stuff. No. Um, I think it's Vic Armstrong. He was like the the head stuntman for a lot of the Bond movies for many, many years. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and, I know what you mean. Yes. Basically, yeah, yeah. I remember reading an article where he was interviewed and he was saying that the big challenge for, for the stunt team was that every single Bond movie, the goal basically in the direction from the production team, the directors and everyone, was that the opening set piece had to be even bigger and better than the movie before. So it'd be interesting going yeah. back for us to do that sort of comparison as well. Um, yeah. Right, I'm going to wrap things up. You've had a long day at work. I've had a long day. Um, I've just heard the front door, so I'm going to have to get dinner on. Uh, but Phil, thank you so much for joining me to wrap all of this up. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I honestly, I can't wait to get into this. This is going to be so awesome. Let me know if you need those Blu-rays and we'll find a way to yeah. get them to you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, well, thanks very much for your time on this uh, on this podcast and uh, we'll uh, look forward to the next one. Exactly. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you once again for joining us. I'd also like to repeat my Happy New Year wishes to you all. Thank you so much for lending me your ears. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to and support the show. Um, I've obviously got so much to do for season four. So many exciting people have been in touch from all over the world asking me if they can be on the show with me. So I'll be lining them up and looking forward to a busy period of recording and editing over the coming weeks and months. As you just found out, Phil and I will be commencing the ultimate James Bond rewatch this month. So look out for those special 007 episodes. You won't have long to wait for the next episode. I do promise the sound doctor, yes, master impressionist himself, Artif Gafar is back and he will be joining me very soon to kick off the new year and the new season of Tailoring Talk. We're starting season four, folks. We made it. Make sure you don't miss a thing by hitting that subscribe button and I'll see you on the next one.